Welcome, welcome on this um, beautiful spring afternoon. It's such a beautiful afternoon to come indoors and hear about natural weather disasters, isn't it? It's just what, just what the doctor ordered. No, but seriously, this is going to be something I think worth um, coming indoors for. Um, this is actually the Star Center's last public event of the semester, and um, not to cast any aspersions on the terrific guests that we've had um, already this year, but I think maybe we've been saving the best for last. And I'm saying that not only because Nona Martin is a gifted scholar and a terrific teacher, but also because um, unlike those speakers of ours who come give a talk and then leave the next day, we can all look forward to having Nona still be around because she just joined us this semester at the Star Center with the title of Special Projects Manager. Now, Special Projects Manager is a title that was actually created when Nona arrived, and I'm still trying to figure out like where the emphasis should lie. Is it like a manager of special projects, or is it a projects manager who is special? Um, and I think both of them actually apply, so I'm actually considering getting in touch with HR and renaming the position Special Special Projects Manager, because Nona is, uh, is special indeed. Um, at the Star Center, she is directing many of the center's student programs, and it's a real pleasure to see so many students um, here right now, especially given the few other things you have going on in your lives this week. And she's directing many um, student programs, including fellowships, scholarships, and weekend road trips that she's already been leading to such exciting destinations, destinations as Antietam and Dorchester County. Um, she's also, together with Michael Buckley, um, launching a new summer oral history program you may have heard about called Story Quest, in which students will gather stories of Kent County during the civil rights era. And I know that uh, Michael and Nona would love to talk to any of you who might um, have ideas or like to participate in that. Um, so in short, she's really hit the ground running in Chestertown with great enthusiasm. Nona is a remarkably versatile talent, having done work in U.S. history, Caribbean history, urban history, public history, and oral history and memory, as well as being an accomplished neurosurgeon. No, I made that part up. <laughs> it's almost. I wouldn't be surprised with Nona. Um, she received her Ph.D. in history from George Mason University last year and earned an MA in public history from Loyola University Chicago. She's also a trained librarian with an MLIS from the University of South Florida. Her articles have been published in several scholarly journals and she's currently at work on a book based on her master's thesis about the 1963 Loyola University Ramblers basketball team, a team that broke racial barriers and also won the NCAA national championship all in one very eventful season, a book I can't wait to read. Nona has a special sense for the way that history can be told through stories, something that I think will come across today as well as in uh, the classes she's planning to teach in the DRW program next year as well as the student program, programs that she's developing and leading here at Washington College. For part of this event, Nona will be joined here on stage by Emily Shamley Wright, um, whom many of you already know. She joined us last summer as provost and dean of the college here at Washington College. For those of you who don't know her, she is an accomplished economist who served as associate dean at Beloit College in Wisconsin, um, and is the author of three past books and is currently working on a new one called Civil Liberty Incubators, Liberal Learning and the Art of Self-Governance. And like Nona, Emily earned her PhD at George Mason and also like Nona, she looks at the world through lenses of multiple disciplines. Combining economics and ethnography, her scholarly work has examined how communities rebound or fail to rebound after catastrophe with particular emphasis on post-Katrina recovery in New Orleans. And in fact, she and Nona worked together on the same oral history project they'll be talking about. Um, before yielding the, the podium, I just want to say a really quick um, personal note, which is that um, this is my last Star Center event for quite a while because I'm going on leave um, starting next month um, and going all the way through next academic year. So, um, but I, I'm, I'm leaving certainly very um, comfortable and actually excited knowing that um, the Star Center is going to be in the hands of people like Nona, like the rest of um, our great staff currently, and Ted Maris Wolf, who's coming aboard as deputy director later this month and will be acting director. So I can tell you that you'll have an exciting year ahead and I look forward to coming back and hearing about it. So now please join me in welcoming Nona Martin to the podium and to Chestertown.
Thank you. Thank you, Adam, again. Doesn't he give great introductions? I'm like, wait, oh, that's me. Thank you guys for coming out, especially the students. I know you're busy, so thank you. Professors, I don't know that y'all have anything to do, so I'm glad you're here anyway. And the rest of you from the community, I'm always happy to see you guys here, so thank you so much. Let me tell you a little bit about the Katrina Project before I get started. Um, I worked with a team of researchers from Beloit College and George Mason University mostly, and we started collecting oral histories about six months after Hurricane Katrina. I did not go out until March of 2007, but all of us together collected about um, 379 interviews. That's 280 hours of interviews. That's 11,000 pages of transcripts. I read them all. The interviews have resulted in some really stellar research, and among them are articles and books by our very own Emily Chamley Wright, and she will be telling us a little bit about them later. What I'm going to do right now is not present any type of analysis or policy, policy proposal. Instead, I'm going to try to let the Katrina returnees speak for themselves, their words, my voice, and maybe we can get to know a little bit more about them. Um, there are four different stories that I'm going to tell. In a way, they're representative, but in a way, they're not. Because Emily can attest to this, and anyone that's done oral history interviews can tell you, even if it's the same community, everyone has a different story. So let's get started, and we'll start with Mary, who um, is going to represent New Orleans East. Mary was a graduate student when, New or uh, when um, Katrina hit. She's a Vietnamese-American, and she lives in New Orleans East, in a particularly small area um, centered on a church, the Mary Queen of Vietnam Catholic Church. And that area had really severe flooding. I'm talking five to 12 foot of water that swept through their houses. However, by August of 2006, a quarter of the residents had already returned. And within a year of the storm, 75% of the residents had already returned. By the summer of 2007, approximately 90% of the residents had returned to that one square mile around Mary Queen of Vietnam Catholic Church. New Orleans, however, had a return rate of only 45% at that time. When we ask Mary about her community and about Katrina, she reflects about the importance of the Catholic Church, Mary Queen of Vietnam. Even before Katrina, the church had a central role in building their unique community. And this was unique. Um, most of them spoke Vietnamese. Most of the stores were able to accommodate their various needs. And um, the church played a very important uh, role in them rebuilding their community. Like, Mary, like very many New Orleanians, Mary originally did not want to leave when she heard that Katrina was coming. For Mary, the decision to stay or to leave was complicated by personal dislikes, family makeup, past storms experience, and family loyalty. Mary says, I never liked to, to evacuate. I don't like sitting in traffic. I'm like, no, no, let's not. And then, because I have like a sister Donna who has Down syndrome, so if we go to stay with someone else, we think like, you know, she's going to be a burden. So we're like, you know, just stay home. And then, so we were contemplating staying home because, you know, it's just going to be another storm like any other storm, and we'll go, and then we'll just have to come back. So we weren't going to go anywhere. Eventually, Mary's dad's best friend convinced him to leave. Then it was Mary's sister's, Mary's fiance's sister's boyfriend that convinced her to leave. Like so many people we meet, when she left, she didn't really know what to expect. But unlike so many people, her place of evacuation was not chosen by FEMA. It was not chosen by the Red Cross. It was chosen by her social connection, her social network. But like everybody else, she spent a lot of time separated from her closest family members, Mary. So we left and went to Dallas. We moved to Dallas, and for a couple of days, everything was okay. Then I went to Homa, and my family stayed in Dallas. And then after a couple of weeks, my dad called. And he's like, it's not working here. It's not working. Because if these people lose anything, they blame Donna, my sister, for taking it. He just couldn't take it anymore. So he says he's going to go to Houston, because we had a lot of evacuees from our community there. So her dad went to Houston. When Mary decided to come back to New Orleans, it wasn't because she missed New Orleans. It wasn't because she particularly wanted to come back. It was because she felt a sense of duty. And it was because the persuasive power of one particular person, Father Vienne. 
Father Vien was the pastor of the Mary Queen of Vietnam Catholic Church. So Father Vien actually called me because they needed people to work. And so then he called me, and I was kind of reluctant because, you know, my family was in Houston, and then my stepmom was going to give birth at the beginning of December, so I was like, you know, I don't want to. But then it's really hard to say no to Father Vien. And so then in the end, I was like, all right, all right, I'll come back. And so November, right after Thanksgiving, I came back by myself. And so then I kept asking my dad, you know, I'm here, Dad. Do you want me to fix up the house? Because we gutted the house, but it was just sitting there. Dad, do you want me to fix up the house? No. His answer was always no. The decision to rebuild was a really difficult one because returning only makes sense if your neighbors are going to return. But then everybody has that same calculation to make. I'm only coming back if you come back. Well, the way that they got over this problem in the Mary Queen of Vietnam church community was through Father Vien. He solved all of that coordination problem for the community. Mary. After about a month, a month and a half, my dad was like, okay, well, let's just start with the roof. Because he was like kind of iffy. He was like, if these people aren't going to return, then there's no reason to do this. We're going to be wasting our money fixing up this house. And I was like, look, I'm here, you're not here. I'm here, and this community is going to come back. And he was like, okay, well, if you say it's going to come back, then let's start with fixing up the roof. So having the key resources is a necessary ingredient for a family to return. Mary. I found a couple of contractors that the people here are recommending, and I contacted them. And my dad gave me $10,000 from our savings to start with whatever I can. So she had $10,000 to start with, and then the insurance company shorted them when they um, did their claim. And so eventually her father had to put $70,000 more from his personal savings to rebuild their house. So even if you know your neighbors are returning, and so rebuilding is then practical, and you have the resources, so rebuilding is then easier, it's still a daunting challenge because most people have no idea how to do construction or how to go about picking the right people to do construction. Mary, remember she was a graduate student. So I got the roof fixed up and then they were putting up sheetrock and stuff, you know, and I don't know how to put up sheetrock, but when they did it, I thought it looked fine, you know, and then my dad came to check on it and he's like, oh my God, they did a horrible job. And dealing with contractors was the biggest challenge. I think I made like a lot of mistakes, you know. Sometimes I got ripped off. I know I got ripped off. I, I would just pay too much when they install something. And basically, I didn't know what they were doing. And I would just see them working and go, oh, okay, they're working. And my dad's like, make sure they're doing it right. How do I know if they're doing it right? I made a lot of runs to Home Depot. I carried stuff, and I took a lot of stuff on myself. At the same time, I was helping other people with FEMA problems, insurance problems. So I was helping them, and then I would have to run home on every break just to check on the contractors. But I didn't know what I was looking for. Remember, Mary came back as a request um, of her priest. And so her job was to work with those returning to get FEMA trailers and to get settled. And it was out of, sh out of sheer necessity and serendipity that she actually became the executive director of a brand new nonprofit. So I was helping with the FEMA trailers. That was my job. I got people signed up for one. That was mainly what I was doing. And now I'm the executive director for the Community Development Corporation. It was incorporated of May 9th of this year. That's 2006. Father Vienne was like, you know, we need a Community Development Corporation because we have a church and you just can't do all these developments with a church. The church shouldn't be involved in that. So we started a CDC. So then I did the research, I went to go talk to the lawyer, and she did the papers, and then I asked Father Vien if he was going to find an executive director, because the lawyer was like, we needed an executive director. So Father Vien was going to put out a whole national search for an executive director, and then so a month later, I talked to Father Vien, I need to know who's going to be the executive director, because the lawyer needs to know. And he says, oh, you're going to be the executive director. <laughs> and I'm like, no. And then I said, I don't want to do it. So next week, we had a pastoral council meeting, and he introduced me as the executive director. <laughs> so it seems like I kind of got stuck in it, you know? I've never been an executive director, so I have no experience. I don't even know what the job description for it is. I'm still working on it right now. I've been doing it for five months. Mary stayed in the position of executive director for three years until the summer of 2009. And under her tenure, the CDC was able to complete a senior living facility. They were able to develop a charter school and start an environmental justice program amongst all of the other things. So it seems like Father Vienne was right all along. 
Mary's community is one of the post-Katrina success stories. Within a year of Katrina, 30% of the residents had returned. And when you visit there now, it's almost completely rebuilt. Other communities have not rebounded so quickly. Here I need to give you a little bit of a note about the stats that I'm going to use. I'm using some statistics that are imperfect indicators of returnees. What I have are um, numbers of active households in the community. And the way you tell a, a household is active is if they've received mail within the last 90 days before the count. But that does not tell us how many people are living in the house. That does not tell us the condition of the house. That does not tell us if these are the same people that were there before Katrina. It just tells us that these households act, are active. So it's imperfect, but it does signal that a community is doing better. So that's, these are the numbers that I'm using. All right, we're going to move to Central City. Arthur is a retired budget analyst for the Navy and the deacon of New Hope Baptist Church in Central City. Central City has historically been a home of immigrants in New Orleans. Um, German, Irish, Italian, Jewish, now African American residents. According to the 2000 census, there were about 8,000 households in Central City. And by 2008, 73% of its residents had returned. And by June of um, 2012, the neighborhood was 89.6% recovered. Many things attach a person to a community. Sometimes living in the community is not the thing that attaches you there, and this will be the case with Arthur. He grew up in Central City, but he moved out shortly after his marriage in 1975, yet he was very much attached to it because of his church. His church started with nine members back in the mid-50s, and it numbered about 2,200 by the time Katrina hit. He grew up um, during a time of segregated New Orleans and felt that to fit in his community he had to be a little bit of a hoodlum. Uh, so he tried to be a ruffian, and he credited his church with saving him from that life. I was growing up in New Orleans, and I had to fit in. And to fit in, I had to be a hoodlum, so I went that route. But when I started going to church, the people there, old and young men here, they gave me an opportunity versus the option I thought I had. The church was in walking distance of the projects, and that's where a lot of its residents lived until they started moving out in the 70s to have better schooling for their children, to have better um, opportunities for themselves. However, many still kept the church as their home, as the center of their lives. And during all hurricanes, this church served as a refuge, and Katrina would be no different. Well, when the storm came, in fact, that Friday, most of them didn't know the storm was going on because we pay attention, but we don't pay attention. That Saturday, we realized that there was a little bit yeah, more eminent. Sunday morning, our pastor said, everybody that can evacuate, we ask that you evacuate if you can. And then reluctantly, but being the man that he was, he said, for those people who can't leave, we'll be here. So he and a few others stayed at the church, and we had about 80 members, mostly old folks, some sick people, some young folks too. They were here at the church, and as always, they thought they were going to come for a couple of days. We brought food, they cooked, we ate, we laughed, the kids played game, but after three days, we had planned to go back home. This didn't happen this time. So we stayed through and we hung out, of a, we hung out and had a pretty rough time that Sunday. Monday was a real mess after the hurricane passed. A few cars that were in the parking lot were damaged pretty bad. Some of them were kind of messed up, but those that were operative, but in those that were operative, we were able to leave out of the church and the pastor and a few other folks we went down towards New Orleans East. When they arrived at New Orleans East, they saw how bad things were, and they saw that they couldn't get back into their homes. And so they decided to evacuate as a group and head to Lake Charles. Yeah, we just loaded up the cars, we siphoned the gas off of every car that was left and put it in the cars that we had. And we left here in a caravan. Okay, just aside. When I hear these stories, I think, I wouldn't even know how to siphon gas. <laughs> oh my goodness, I would be stranded forever. Okay, back to Arthur. We left the day of the hurricane. That afternoon, we started driving. And once we got there, they had food prepared and everything. They fed everyone, and then we went over to another church, also in Lake Charles. And they had converted their educational building into a mini hotel. We stayed there for two and a half, maybe even three weeks. Our pastor wouldn't leave until he made sure all the members that were with us, all 80 of us, were dispersed and going to someplace that was more stable than when we were. 
uh, whether it was with family or some temporary housing. He wanted to make sure we were set and had a job or whatever. So New Hope, the church, relied on a number of churches within their network of, for assistance, and it really paid off for them. We was one of the few churches back here in the city. And once we came back, we were just blessed from around the country. They were sending 18-wheel tractor loads of everything, clothing, food, water, canned goods. They were just sending stuff. I mean, some of it was amazing, man. There was this one guy out of Mississippi. His church was destroyed, and so he had a school bus and nothing to do with it, a yellow school bus in his backyard. He gave it to us for getting around the city, trying to do whatever we could for people. And then another church in North Carolina, they sent a tractor trailer full of clothing and supplies and water. We had this thing pretty much going. We had a room that was filled up for our eatery, just water and canned goods, and we just opened the doors and had flyers going out to all the FEMA sites, West Bank, East Bank, by the library. And we let them know if you need anything, you need food, you need supplies, whatever, whatever the case may be, you stop by and get whatever. So although New Hope Baptist Church had relations with some other churches, um, they also got things from many people they did not know. And through these generous donations, the church was able to reach out and help Katrina victims beyond their own congregants. Some of these people, we had never even, ever even heard of them. We didn't even know them. They just heard about us. They may know one church or somebody or whatever, and someone would say, New Hope is down there trying to do the best they can. If you got some stuff, you want to send it to New Hope. They'll get it out. And we had people walking and picking up stuff. They'd come through, ladies, babies, everybody. They'd just come, no restrictions. You get what you need. You carried what you could. You put it on your truck, whatever. That's just what we did. We received a whole bunch. There was this guy, he was a millionaire, I guess. Well, I hope he's a millionaire. He gave Lake Charles, Baton Rouge, New Orleans a million dollars, and we set up an FH Dunn Recovery Center in the building back there. And that was all about helping people pay their rent, get their utilities on, buy different things. And although there were other churches that were open in New Orleans, there were some that did not reopen after their storms. Their, their doors remained closed. Yeah, quite a few churches, the pastors are not there. And then there were churches where pastors would come back, but there would be no members. So it took, because it took so long for the city just to get things together. And they kept saying, we want you to come back. But what am I coming back to? I don't have a school for my kids. I don't have a place to stay that's affordable. I need a decent job. Without those things in place, what am I coming back to? Two and a half years later, a great portion of our population has not come back. You see, for a long time, and if you read any of Emily's work, you can hear all about why. Um, for a long time, the city refused to provide even the most basic of services to various community because not enough community members had returned. But the community members were not returning because they didn't have basic services. So this chicken and egg problem really complicated the recovery. And those that did come back faced really serious hardships. The most basic of things became hardships. You know, some of those roach-infested rat holes that some people used to pay $200 and $300 to live in, these things are now $1,200 and $1,400. They have to be going crazy. But people are trying to do the best they can, and they're trying to stay as close as they can because they don't have transportation. You might find an affordable apartment in different areas of the city, in Metairie or whatever, but their jobs were over here. And I mean, what do you do if you can't get around? Like most people, <laughs> Arthur had a laundry list of what could be done to help people to recover and to make their efforts simpler. And his biggest, um, his biggest idea was just to simplify the process, that government aid, how you can get it from one place to another, what the um, deadlines were. These were things that people didn't know. And with a bit of despair, that was not like any of the rest of his interview, he explains that people need the whole package. They were incapable of coming back if they just had piecemeal help. I don't know. I'm just passing my own opinion around about this stuff, but it's two and a half years later and people are still struggling, trying to get their lives together. I never imagined it would take that long. Never imagined it. But when you look at it, families really need the total package. So a man has a job, but what good is it if he doesn't have a place to stay? What good of it is if he has a place to stay if he can't pay rent? What good is having a place to stay and a job but no school to put my kids in to get a decent education? And everyone for sure wants a safe neighborhood in spite of what they may think. So a lot of factors have to be in place. And since they're not in place, a lot of people are apt to run back, are not apt to run back here because they're running back to nothing. And some folks, they just moved away.
Next, we move to Gentilly. Gentilly is a very interesting community because um, it's kind of made up of three different neighborhoods, um, Pontchartrain Park, Gentilly Woods, and Gentilly Terrace. Edward was born in Slidell, Louisiana, and he lived in Pontchartrain Park subdivision. Um, this area is right next to Lake Pontchartrain. Lake, hurricane, not good. In Pontchartrain Park, by 208, only by 2008, only 38% of the population had returned. By 2012, it was 89.2% recovered, with most of the recovery taking place between 2010 and 2012. Gentilly is next to the London Avenue Canal, which you might have all heard about. It failed and caused upwards of 12 feet of water to sweep through the area. Edward is an 80-year-old black man with some Native American ancestry, and he moved into this neighborhood that was originally not very eager for his presence, not because of race, but because of class. But he was able to um, buy a house there anyway. This land used to be swamp, and some land developer bought the swamp and developed it into lots, and they built houses here. They built a subdivision. They were building these houses for middle class people. I tried to buy a house here, and I couldn't buy one. First, they said I was too young. I must have been about 20, 21, but I was too young. So I saw a sign on this lot, and I said, I'm not going to talk to him. I'm just going to call him. For sale by owner. I called a man. He wanted $5,000. I said, man, I got your money right now, right here. So he let me buy the lot. And then we built a house, and my wife and I, we had two children at the time. Now we have a total of four children. When I moved into here, I had a truck, and I was a furniture move that, mover. I did that for 23 years before I quit that. But when we moved in, discrimination was so bad. All they wanted back here was doctors and school teachers, lawyers, and postal employees. And here comes an old truck driver. Not only was he able to buy, but he was able to help his brother-in-law move in as well. His brother-in-law also was working class. Oh, yes, indeed. I knew everybody around here. In fact, out of these people, when they grow old, they were good to go. When those people over there got old, I took care of them. I would go to the store and get groceries for them. They was old and senile, but I'd go get the grocery. I cut their grass. I kept their place manicured. I did that for those people, too, me and my friend, until he died. Not only did it seem to be a tight-knit neighborhood, but the neighboring subdivisions also were integrated into one community. Yeah, I go to church and walk in distance from here around the corner. It's called St. Gabriel the Archangel, large church, large enough to take care of Pontchartrain Park, Gentilly Woods, and something else. Three subdivisions was all going to that church. There's still a church there, and there's always seating. We all go to the same church. It's a mixed church. You name it, they had it. Chinese, Vietnamese, Japanese, Caucasians, Negroes. We had Hispanics and everything in there. The Pontchartrain Park neighborhood was actually a historic, de a historic development. It was one of the first subdivisions that, were, that was built mostly for middle class blacks. Yeah, when things settled down, they had mostly school teachers back here. People followed. One came back and told everybody how nice it was, and then they all came, just like that. It was the nicest thing in New Orleans at the time. All they had in New Orleans at that time for blacks was shacks and bungalows. So this was the nicest thing that came about. And my wife, she knew everybody. They formed a group back there. She was friends with the woman across the street, at the corner, around the corner. They used to have their, their little meetings sometimes. Sometimes there was 35 women in my house. Man, that's why I had to make that bigger. She had a lot of friends. And it was a real nice, nice neighborhood, I tell you. It's different from night and day the way it was before Katrina. Everybody would be passing and laughing, hey, Edward, how you doing? All the houses were manicured. It looked as if they were freshly painted. You know, it was nice. You didn't see a lot of old, broke down cars on the street. They had no cars parked in the street. Everybody had flowers. They had palm trees, rose bushes. Indeed, it was a good place to raise kids. It was remarkable. At that time, you didn't even have to put locks on your doors. You could go outside. Nobody would come in. Nobody would bother you. It was remarkable. We had volunteer security, but it wasn't nothing for them to do. And then the neighbor went, neighborhood over, underwent changes over the years. And by the time Katrina hit, it was completely different. I've been robbed in this house three times. Those little babies and those angels that when they were smaller, they grew up to be devils when they got big. I was here sleeping and whatnot, and a guy came in, took a paint out the window, and crawled like a military crawl, came through the bedroom. And like a fool, I jumped up in my pajamas. I ran him out, you know. I could have been killed. Fortunately, that didn't happen. Like so many victims of Katrina, Edward lost most of his possessions during the storm. Let me tell you about the storm. 
Nine o'clock Sunday morning, the mayor of New Orleans came on and said, if you haven't left New Orleans yet, please do so now. This is the real deal. Please go. All I have to tell you is please go. And I said, I guess I should go. I had four dogs. I'm a dog lover. I had three Yorkshire Terrier, one Siberian Husky. I paid almost $1,000 for that Siberian Husky. He was beautiful. He was one of a kind. Anyway, so my wife made up her mind that we could go. And so we started throwing stuff in the car, you know. I put the dogs in the car. I put her cat in the trunk. And I got all of their, yeah, he said that. I got, I got all their leashes and all their food and everything and put it in the trunk. And I packed us a basket, tuna fish, chicken, crackers, cookies, put it in the car, and we left. First, we went to Jackson, Mississippi. It was so bad. Then we went to another place, still in Mississippi, but it was a little better. Finally, we got to Georgia. So when I left, I went to my son-in-law's house. We stayed with him, living in Atlanta. I left my wife there, and I came back to this house the same week. You couldn't even see this house. We was in a boat, you know, and every once in a while, you'd see over a rooftop. There was so much water back here. I mean, all you could see was rooftops, rooftops and trees, branches all over the place. This house was completely underwater. I went back to Atlanta for three weeks. Then I came back here. Um, my son and I rented a house back there in New Iberia, and we stayed there. When the water went down, I came back, and I swept the water out of this house. We had to take all our furniture out and throw it away. I would advise, actually, I would advise anybody not to put money in furniture in New Orleans, in general, because we saw three floods in this house. It was rough. I mean, everything you work for, it was cleared away. We had to throw everything away, clothes, shoes, furniture, everything. If it wasn't nailed down, and even some of that, you had to throw away. Everything had to go. Even though some houses, not the entire block, on his neighborhood have been rebuilt, and even though some people are back, not nearly enough, things have changed, and the sadness of Katrina is never far from his memory. Just opening his front door reminds him. Let me tell you about this house over there. A lady and her husband, they died, and their grandson was living there. He was a lawyer. He just turned a lawyer. Him and his girlfriend and another girl drowned right there in that house. They wouldn't leave, and they drowned. Now his mother is in the house, just like the house where that truck is parked. That's the friend who we used to have a little drink every Christmas. He drowned too. He was in the house doing good, but then he walked out to tell someone he needed help or that he was hungry. And he walked and the water kept getting higher and he stepped off the curb and hit his head and he drowned. He drowned right there. But in the next breath, after telling you about the tragedy, Edward moves on and talks about his neighborhood, about how fond he is and how much he loves it. Yet he tells you that if he had known what the struggle would be like, to recover, he would have never come back. Let me tell you, if I'd known what I know now, I would never rebuild this house. I'd have kept going. If I have to evacuate again, I'm not coming back. I'm too old for that. I'm 80 years old. I don't know what made me come back. Well, yes, I do. This is home, you know. I lived here. I don't care who you are or what you are. There's no place like home. You always want to come back. It's not always a very good thing, but you always want to come back home. I'm so sorry I did. It was expensive. My wife and I could have bought a house where we were staying, a larger house than this, a swimming pool, three car garages, a nice big yard, fruit yard, fruit trees in the yard, the works, nice lawn. And me, like a fool, I came back. And I spent three times that much here for this. Everything is expensive now. Before I left here, before Katrina, you could buy a loaf of bread for 120. Now bread costs you 240. You could buy a gallon of milk for two something. Now a gallon of make milk costs you near $5. And people are taking advantage of other people. I went to the store yesterday to buy two screws for the lawnmower, two bolts. That man charged me $5 for two bolts. He was able, Edward, to survive off money in his savings, his social security, his military pension, and some money from his insurance. It had been, it, <clears throat> It has been too costly to start his vending machine business again because most of his equipment had been destroyed. And like so many, he didn't wait for government assistance. Well, you know, the insurance company didn't treat me fair, but I'm, I'm satisfied. I was able to bounce back right quick, but I couldn't wait for Road Home. I couldn't wait for FEMA or Red Cross or anything. I just came and went to work and got this house back together. You know, the insurance came in afterwards, and they surveyed the damage, and I got about 130000 It wasn't enough to rebuild, refurnish, and get everything I needed, but... It was all right. When he finally did ask for assistance, like many others, he got none, and the process seemed to him unfair and lopsided. I've been waiting a year and a half for the road home, and you know what they told me? They told me I'm disqualified, and I got to reapply. So I reapply, and I got a response. Still got no money. 
Did I expect more? Well, I guess not. You don't expect anything from the government. You got to take care of yourself. That's why I paid off this house with the insurance money. I ran out so fast. I spent all of my savings, all the insurance money, trying to get back to where I'd like to be. But it's okay. Still, it looks like other people are getting the money they don't need. I've got this daughter-in-law. Well, she's not my daughter-in-law. She just lives with my son. She's a doctor. They gave her over $200,000 to fix up her house, and they didn't even get any water in their house. Because of so little money, because there were contractors that were untrustworthy, like many other returnees, Edward had to do much of the work himself. Remember, he was turning 80 when Katrina hit. Yeah, I've been doing most of this work myself, me and my son. The contractors we hired for air conditioning and electrical and plumbing. But the woodwork and the sheetrock and the painting, we did that all ourselves. It's too expensive otherwise. I put the roofs and the, the roof on and the shingles up, but they all blew down when a good wind came. You see how they blown down there? But when you're poor, you learn that you have to do a lot of things by yourself. <coughs> that was one of the things, and I know Emily can tell you how true it is. You would walk into, a lot of the interviews took place in FEMA trailers or in houses where they would show you how far up the mold came or in um, outside behind the house or sitting on a truck that they had just brought a carton full of things from Home Depot from. And you'd often be there with six-year-olds and seven-year-olds who told you, oh yeah, we sheetrocked that entire house by ourselves. And you're feeling really small <laughs> at that time. And then they'll tell you, we had to rip it down because there was mold behind it. Then we sheetrocked it again. You just walked away with a sense of awe and amazement at some of the things that these people went through in order to come back to um, New Orleans. This last interview is with a lady who calls herself Miss Miriam. Um, this was my most favorite and least favorite interview all at the same time. Um, it's, she's a very compelling character. She's a very complicated character. And um, I'll let her talk for herself. Miss Miriam is how she referred to herself. She's an African-American woman of uh, in undiscernible, indiscernible age. I asked her, she told me three different ages, three centuries apart, and I could believe either of them. She's a lifelong resident of the Upper Ninth Ward, the Ninth Ward, and the area, this area is east of, center, of city center and it's relatively poor, predominantly um, black community. It's divided into Upper and Lower Ninth Ward and then further broken down into different neighborhoods like Florida, Desire, St. Claude. 81% of the homes in the Lower Ninth Ward suffered damage, and almost two years after the storm, 2007, only 7% of pre-Katrina population had returned, and 2012, only 30.3% had returned. Miss Miriam. I've been in this house about three years. We moved in this house a week before Katrina. I was living in the one a block down the street, though. I lived there for about two years. I've been in this area all my life. My parents lived across in the Ninth Ward, the Lower Ninth Ward. See, this is considered the Upper Ninth Ward. I've always been in this neighborhood, though, all around here. Well, we're in, we were in the process of buying this house, but we was renting the one down the street, but we own this one. Buying a house was not always something blacks could do in this area, and Miss Merriam recalls when the change occurred. Oh, yeah, after civil rights, we were able to purchase homes anywhere we wanted because it would be biased if you didn't sell to me. And then those that can move out, they did. And the other ones, the poor whites that got trapped down here, they changed the name. The minute the white folks, um, the minute the white folks moved over to that side, they didn't want to be living in Ninth Ward anymore. So they say, "Oh, we in Bywater District now." <laughs> they don't want to say, "I'm living in the Ninth Ward," so it's the Upper Ninth. So they changed the name. There were many amazing things that people did to um, overcome, had to overcome during the storm, and part of the reason why they were able to overcome it so easily relatively so, is because they were not strangers to storms in their own lives. When reminiscing about life before the storm, Miss Miriam showed that she too was all too familiar with grief. She spoke of it with a strength that would also come through as she shared her Katrina experience. Yeah, I got children. My son, he's living with his father because he, well, actually he set the house on fire, which killed my other two kids. And I can't live with that. Every time I look at him, I, I gave him back to his father and they relocated in Texas with him because of Katrina, and he hasn't come back, and that's okay. But my oldest living boy, he's the one I got living here with me now. 
He came back post Katrina. He came back that Thursday. And my oldest son, my other son, they got work. Him and his seven kids there, they relocated because of Katrina. And they're not coming back. And then the other children, well, they're dead. Two in the fire, one by gunshot within six months' time of each other. Miss Merriam recalls that before Katrina, there was always a lot going on in her neighborhood. Although she was not always an active participant in the festivities, she was always very neighborly. <laughs> oh, yeah, we used to have a lot of festivals back here on Pine King. When we would get together for what you call it, those potluck things, they used to have parades, and they would start right here. You would just march all the way down to the quarter, and they'd pick up people as they go. And I knew everybody in the neighborhood. Before Katrina, the neighborhood was bustling. I had people, you know, like I had this old lady across the street. She was 90 year, 89 years old. Yeah, she is 90 now. She would ask, Miss Miriam, what you doing? Nothing. What you want? <laughs> you want something from the store? If you're going that way. She knew I wasn't going that way. But I got her something from the store anyway. And we used to sit on the porch, and we was talking through the whole storm. I wasn't scared. She watched as others evacuated, but felt no need to do so herself. She stayed in her house during the entire storm. Oh, yeah. My neighbor, she's an attorney, her and her husband, who's an accountant. Well, we were sitting on the porch, and we laughed at them because they was evacuating. We said, what y'all doing? She said, Miss Marion, we going. And I said, cowards. <laughs> well, we didn't expect for it to flood up here. My son, the one that's staying with me, him and his girlfriend were hit. And then they moved to Atlanta, Georgia. And I ended up staying there for a little bit after the storm. But during the storm, I slept through that. I took two Xanax, and that was it. <laughs> I was out. Then we was over at the tire shop out on Louise and St. Claude so my, so, my fiance, so my fiance could stay with his shop because he couldn't leave his equipment and everything. You've probably seen him on CNN because they just did a report on him because he stayed. He helped the policemen fix their tires. He helped the National Guards. And because of what he did for them, they brought him two generators so he could have power to fix their tires and stuff. Well, eventually my sister came and she said, let's go. And I thought, I ain't doing nothing. So I walked with them to the convention center. And they said, well, why are we going to the convention center? We should go to the Superdome. Mm-mm. Miriam had chosen the convention center because she had evacuated to the Superdome in other hurricanes. And she remembers the tension and the violence that took place there. At the convention center, she had a different experience. She became the linchpin in bartering and the strategist in acquisitioning required material. I was in the convention center for about three or four days, and I was the Indian runner. You don't know what that is? Yeah, like say you had pepper and you had milk, but you needed milk and you needed pepper. That's where I came in. They would be like, Miss Miriam, do you have any water? Wait, we're missing an egg. Do you know if we could get this, we could get that? See these badass wannabe gangsters strutting up and down the convention center, and they were scared to go to the icebox by themselves. Eventually, I see the military was right across the street from us in this hotel. They had a water tank, and they hooked it up behind the convention center, so I went back there to see what was going on, and I discovered an ice maker. We was in business then. And then, when they weren't around, we just started cooking out in the kitchen in the hotel, me and my cousin Claudia. And finally, the military left altogether. They left the hotel, and I says to myself, there's 29 floors over there. They got blankets and shit up there. Let's go get them. <laughs> I even helped them. Uh, well, I told them how to steal. I said, look, you put the TV and the radio, whatsoever you're going to steal, on the bottom. And then you put the blankets and the food on the top. And then nobody's going to stop you. So they did that. And every night they would go out raiding. And the food and the blankets, they would put at the foot of my cot. And when I get up in the morning, I'd go give them to the old folks and the young people and the women and the children. Those that I know couldn't go out and get their own stuff. I gave it to them. After the convention center, she evacuated to Austin. Although she was impressed at how well the city of Austin responded, like many that we interviewed, she was impressed, but she hated it there. She wanted to go back home. She stayed there only until she could track down her mother. Then she went to Vicksburg for seven months. Then she finally came back home, and it was to a deserted area, a neighborhood. Yeah, it's kind of sad, but I got through it. So I got my house together. I moved in here. I chained my generator up. I got an air mattress, I put it in the middle of the floor, I got a TV, I ran some cords through it, I took my one dog, I put him outside, because he's bad. I took my two dogs, I put them inside, I put on a western, and I went to sleep. 
sort of. I could hear them outside. You know, I could hear them running from the military police. See, they was up to no good. They were stealing people's things in their houses, their mantelpieces, going and taking people's bathtubs. After Katrina, the neighborhood really was different. On this side, it was still kind of a bustling neighborhood. But a lot of the older people from 60s on up, they didn't want to come back. And they was my friends. It was too hard for them to rebuild. And some of them, they don't have any kids to help them. And some of them that do have kids to help them, the kids are stealing their money. So they can't help themselves. Or they stole whatever little money they got and so they won't come back home. And they're stuck wherever they got sent. It's a sad time. A number of people we talked to described Katrina as a mixed blessing. One woman told us how she was able to build a mansion in the place of what was once a shack. Another person described it as a great big washing machine, washing out all the sin. When asked if she felt safe in her home on a mostly deserted street, not only did she feel safe, but Miss Merriam also saw Katrina as a positive, saw Katrina as a positive. A lot of people keep saying there's a lot of criminal elements coming back. Maybe they are, but they can only stay here if you let them, and I feel safe. I'm not doing nothing that I should have to worry about. And New Orleans ain't never looked better. Let me tell you, people that trash under their houses, in, in their lives, under their houses and in their lives. Been there for 50, 60 years. Katrina blew all that shit out, just cleaned up all that. Stuff people needed to do, it got done. It finally got done. New Orleans, particularly the Ninth Ward, has a, have a um, New Orleanians, particularly the Ninth Ward, have a strong place attachment. Miss Merriam gives a perfect example of that. With all of her troubles and all of her heartaches, she summed up in one sentence what a lot of other New Orleanians feel about their home. New Orleans, let me tell you something. New Orleans is a beautiful place, even in the storm. Thank you. Okay, so Emily um, Chamley Wright is going to come up and um, she's going to tell you a little bit about her work. Um, she used the interviews a lot in her work as a basis, uh, kind of an ethnograph ethnographic study from which she w was able to draw some pretty, and I think they're pretty stellar conclusions, but I'll let her tell you about that. And then afterwards we'll take questions. Thank you, Nona. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, have you here. It's just it is to, it, isn't it right? <laughs> right. Um, and in some ways, I, it is always tempting to talk about the public policy conclusions and stuff that we that we've done as part of this because there there is a lot of uh, to to say about. Uh, public policy after after a uh, natural disaster, and what what can what kinds of policies and and rules can work wonders and really help people kind of tap their capacity and move forward very quickly, and what kinds of well-meaning policies end up actually making things harder. That's one of the themes that um, uh, Virgil Store and I have have um, developed in our work. Uh, and that's that's kind of like meat and potatoes of an economist is to is to do that sort of work and then also to talk about the collective action problems that the, the collective action problem that Nona described where it's one person wants to come back but they don't know if they can come back unless other people come back and they want to come back but they know, don't know if they really want to come back unless other people are going to come back because they they're all scattered across. Um, you know every every which uh, every which place, and they can't communicate with each other to really coordinate. So it's a kind of people are waiting and seeing what happens. But if I'm waiting on the sidelines, everybody else is waiting, and so it's a that's what we call a collective action problem. Well, that you know, economists just kind of go, oh, we love these kinds of problems because there's so much fun, you know, to to, to wrestle through and how how that sol how they get solved. And so like the Father Vian story is one answer there about, well, here's how you can, through um, this sort of civic action, overcome a collective action problem, is through this kind of leadership. Uh, and so this is a good good story. But, um, and, and so I, I would love to talk uh, more about that work at some other point, but I think for this moment, what's um, uh, fun to, to talk a little bit about is how much economists need historians. 
You know, that's that's really the takeaway point after listening to Nona here is that um, it is how there's this bleeding of um, the human uh, uh, the humanist story in terms of the oral history piece of this and the social scientific story that economists are trying to to tell. And we I have um, a background in ethnography that uh, it, that reaches back to my work in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and my sense of going back to graduate school was that a Economists were missing some really precious tools in their toolkit because they tended not to talk to people. Um, you know, we, I know it's a little strange, you know, but uh, I, you know, Andy, am, am, I, am I being uncharitable to our kind? No, no, we don't, we don't know how to talk to people. That's why we become economists. But, um, uh, and, and so economists don't tend to do that. And so it's an odd thing for an economist to go in and, and to systematically talk to people in this kind of ethnographic methodology. And, and so I already had that predisposition going into this. Uh, so I knew that stories were important sources of data, of information. But what was interesting in this, and this is why economists still need historians, is that it's not only that the story is a form of data, the story itself became, I discovered, you know, I, I, it, came, I, it hit me like a ton of bricks when I was down there, is that the stories themselves were levers that people were using to come back. So in the Vietnamese American community, for example, the story of how people came to that particular location in New Orleans, you would hear it over and over and over again. From one interview to the next, you would hear some version of the recounting of, well, in the 1950s, the folks from three different villages in North Vietnam all fled to this particular village, fishing village in South Vietnam. And that's where, that's how this community really got started because we're all connected to those folks. And then after the Vietnam War, we were dislocated again and Catholic Charities reestablished us here in New Orleans. And this place is like a second homeland to us. And that language would repeat itself, second homeland interview after interview. The story would repeat itself, interview after interview. And the punchline of the story was almost always the same. And compared to that, Katrina, <laughs> ah, not so much, you know, not a big deal. Now, so why is that important? It's that the, the storytelling, was, it was clearly being told from the pulpit over and over and over again. It was told from neighbor to neighbor. It was told from grandmother to grandchild over and over again. So even the, you, even the young people would, would tell you the story, but would say, and so after what my grandma went through, how could I tell her that I'm not coming back? You know, so you'd hear that over and over again. And so the, that the power of story was eye-opening to the economist who tends to think about resources in a very particular way. It's about the monetary resources, for example, okay? Infrastructure. But there's this social infrastructure. There's this kind of invisible infrastructure in the stories we tell each other that, was, that we are able to capture with this kind of methodology. And there's a particularly powerful way in which that comes to the forefront when we have an oral historian who tells that story. So I think that, that's where I'm going to stop, and, and, and uh, uh, I think we're open to questions and answers right now. Um, I have a particular insight that I'll share with you later. Uh, Father Vian uh, and Mary, who I had met both of them. Uh, Father Vian is as close as it comes to being a living saint mm -hmm. in that community. And I think it points to something uh, larger, I think, uh, Dean, you were speaking about this. Um, what was absent um, at multiple levels, uh, especially in the first two years after Katrina, was leadership, uh, both political leadership uh, in the city and, and, to, and the state as well. Uh, but the community leadership that is evidenced by Father Vienna was remarkable. Um, and it was a great pleasure working with, uh, with the Vietnamese community in all the walls east. But I hope we have a chance to follow up yeah. all that firsthand from the day after the storm for the next four years.
That would be great. And you're absolutely right. The community leadership was amazing. There were other um, community centers and community organizations that played similar roles as well and in other, other communities. Example, different uh, organization is uh, the St. Bernard Project. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? Yep. I, I work very closely with them. They yeah. were two great kids. Yeah. And, and one of the uh, uh, questions is, you know, what is the structure of the social capital infrastructure? In, in a context like the Vietnamese community, you had this kind of ready-made structure in the church where there's lots of um, authority and hierarchy that kind of lent itself. Well, what if you're in a community where you've got lots and lots and lots of churches, right. but they're all decentralized? Mm -hmm. And you might have um, very, very you know, strong pastors, pillars of the community, but they're dependent on a job out, you know, on a, on a job that where they make their money, and then they're volunteering their time in, in the in the small church, and so without their jobs, they had to they had to go. The, so the the pastor dislocation in a lot of the African American communities was a big piece of uh, the a kind of vacuum effect immediately after the storm, and then the ingenuity with which they said, okay, now we've got to network each other. We've got to work with each other to find ways to come back. And one example was a. Uh, a priest uh, or a, fa um, a pastor in the Desire community who said, okay, I'm, I'm just going to polish off this old contractor's license we've got in the family yep. and I'm going to start providing contracting services. And guess what? In those days, if you could find a respected member of the church community to be your contractor, that was like <laughs> money in the bank. You know, that was, that was gold. And he used those resources to cross-subsidize the return of people in his church community who couldn't have otherwise afforded it. And he chose very carefully, he chose the matriarch who would be the stable person who would provide the space in the couch or the space in the floor to help another connected family uh, come back. So um, you, they had to be more um, creative. Uh, but there, w there were these other kinds of quiet uh, leadership that were happening all over. Like the musician, the community of musicians. Mm -hmm. um, they had their way of agents talk to their, their, their musicians, we're going to set you up, we're going to help you get some place to stay. And there was no real central authority figure there either, but they had a way of taking care of each other. So I appreciate what you guys have done, but my question is this. I'll caveat this by saying I was a my PhD is from LSU and sea level rise in, in the Delta area. So the ninth ward in that area, the story is it will happen again. How do you resolve that with the folks that reoccupy that with the with the knowledge, with the truth that this, the industrial canal was predicted to be the conduit for this flood in nineteen eighty two. It will happen again. How do you rectify that with people that have reoccupied? Do you want to take that one? Yeah, I can, I can tell you that that's not a theme that's unfamiliar to them. They, they know, they suspect that it'll happen again. A lot of them suspect that there was a conspiracy to cause it to happen in the first place. But they come back because it's home. I, I don't know if there's anything for me to resolve in the way they feel about that. That's just, I mean, there are some that didn't return. I'm not going to do this again. But then there are some, I remember Betsy, and the water came up to here. My grandmother told me about it. But yeah, I'll be here. I'm coming back. Yeah, that was a real challenge for us because, again, if you are, uh, if you're interested, if you're, uh, as a pol political economist, I'm really interested in questions of what are policies that seem to be um, almost engineered to create the wrong incentives. And yeah. so the National Flood Insurance Program, for example, is one of those where we subsidize people occupying spaces that are very, very dangerous. And, um, and, and it's p politically very difficult to get rid of a program like that once it's in place. And so as a political economist, I can run completely in that direction. And in fact, some of our work, um, uh, some of my work with uh, Dr. Storr does look at that, um, does take on that piece of it. But we thought that if we ran too far down that road with, with our um, public policy analysis, all of our attention would be in that direction. Mm -hmm. There was lots of people doing good work in that, um, in that arena. And, and we thought we really had a bigger contribution to make to talk about what are the forms of social resilience. Um, because there's lots of times that 
uh, you know, we do really want people to come back in the in a in a post-conflict set setting or in a post-disaster setting, and we need to understand the elements of what makes that possible. What are the elements of social resistance? And so we thought that that was where our comparative advantage lot, uh, 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 was um, uh, was, and we also thought that in some ways it was the more interesting work that economists needed to learn more about. Because economists were really good on the public policy stuff. We know the incentives arguments, and there were p good people doing that work. But we really wanted to kind of edge out that where's that intersection between the sociology and of, of storytelling, uh, the sociology of sense of place, and how that intersects with the economics of, of the situation. And so that's why we decided to direct our work there, even though as a, you know, in terms of if I put my public policy hat on, I agree with you. Doc, this Dr. Storr she's talking about is my husband. And um, <laughs> we would have really interesting discussions where he would say, well, they just shouldn't settle there. And I'm like, you economists are just so cold. These are people. What are you going to tell them? They can't come back home. Well, they shouldn't. You know, so, and that's another thing. When you're sitting there with people who have struggled and put their last dime into coming back, your heart is with them. You wish them the best, and you hope that I don't know. There are no more hurricanes ever. The the other the other thing response though on the emotional side is that you saw that yeah there was that argument, but you also saw political interests lining up against the the people who were residents in these neighborhoods. Um, that that you know the Bring New Orleans Back Commission, for example, um, it was just laced and loaded with. Um, political and economic and business interests that were squarely aligned directly against the interests of um, uh, uh, property owners in the Ninth Ward, for example. And really, I mean, it was just so blatantly, egregiously obvious that the development interests were saying, let's use the power of eminent domain to shut these communities down and not let people come back, because this will be prime real estate for us to redevelop in some way that, is a, that will you know, take into account the possibility of flood, but will be uh, particularly advantageous to business interests. And you see that lining up with the political interests, and you kind of get mad at that too, yeah. right? So, so we, and so I, I keep coming back to this moment in a in a Bring New Orleans Back um, Commission meeting where it was clear that the uh, there was a proposal to have widespread use of eminent domain um, to disallow rebuilding in a lot of um, African American neighborhoods. And there's a guy from the Ninth Ward who said, you know, he stood up and he and he said, if you all come in here, I'm going to suit up like you know in a suit of armor. And I'm going to get my gun, and I'm going to keep what's mine, mm -hmm. you know. And I was like, "Well, that's just chilling, you know. That's just chilling." And then you got a, you got a roaring round of applause, right? And it was that was that's the other piece of it that that I saw as being the the human side of this conflict. That many of the scientific arguments were really lining up so neatly with the uh, political and business interests that I, it made me a little nervous too, right? Even though you know, we, we can use rationality to sort fish from fowl, it made me cautious um, when um, some of these arguments were being deployed by people who had a real vested interest in the outcomes. It, we, need to, we need to be able to have a sniff test on those, on those arguments too. Jamie? Um, what was what your process in how you came to interview these 300 odd people, or were they volunteers? And how, how no, we, 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 <laughs> we told them that they had to talk to us. Right? <laughs> yes, they were all volunteers. They were all volunteers. They were all volunteers. Sometimes they were interviews that were set up, and neighbors pointed us to neighbors. Sometimes we just saw people on the side of the road. And um, I had my most interesting interview in a funeral home next to a dead body because we saw the mortician there and we said, he looks like someone interesting to interview. Yeah. Um, I've noticed a constant theme of this discussion is the effectiveness of these sort of uh, uh, grassroots social constructs like the church, um, or even having uh, life savings, as opposed to the insurance companies and business interests, which tend to be incredibly unreliable, and uh, the government, which tend to be relatively unreliable. Uh, would this suggest perhaps an alternate system of uh, flood insurance 
as opposed to the current system where it's just a sort of contestable monetary distribution. Uh, something more like the church, I mean, it, the re religion aspect not, is not necessary, but some sort of uh, grassroots social level has, I don't know, is that, is that something you've been getting, like that, that's an especially effective system for dealing with, with uh, disasters compared to uh, insurance? I think insurance is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I think the I think uh, insurance as as such is not is not a bad thing. The concern with the national flood insurance program is that cr it, is that it artificially suppresses the true cost of living in a particular place. Um, so so I think that's that's the concern. Um, and it, so when I'm deciding, do I want to live here or here? I'm not disciplined to take into account the full cost of that choice if someone else is sort of, you know, footing at least part of the bill or a big chunk of the bill of, of, me, of, my, of that particular choice. So I think that's the incentives problem. But you're, you're, I think the other piece, the other thread is to say, is there capacity within communities to deal with the various effects of disaster? And I think the answer there is yes, okay? So this is just a, a silly, dead dumb example. Um, but uh, it goes to show what a difference can make if you just tap the local knowledge of people who you're trying to help. So when they loaded up buses outside of the convention center in the Superdome, um, it was very much a militaristic kind of command and control operation. And you know, certain people were let on at, at certain at times. They, it, was, it was very much like a cattle car kind of situation. Um, and they were, you know, you didn't get any choice in the matter, right? And, and people were deathly afraid of being separated from their children, okay? Um, and what would it have made, it, what a difference it would have made if they had put a big sign on the side of the bus, this bus is going to Baton Rouge, this bus is going to San Antonio, this bus is going to Atlanta. Hey, I've got people in Atlanta, right? I'll get on that bus. But instead, you were forced into some bus. You didn't know where it was going until you stopped. Yeah. And you got out, and there was the chances then of you having folks that you knew that could help you. Now we're, we, haven't been, we haven't tapped into the capacity that that person's family is capacity. Yeah. Adam? Yeah, please. Um, I'm, just, I'm curious, Nona, you know, at the time that you were working on this project, you were also working on your dissertation, which was about another community um, facing another kind of a crisis, the right. um, community of the Bahamas um, dealing with the civil rights struggles there in the 1940s. And I just, I wonder how these two projects spoke to each other if New Orleans informed Nassau and Nassau informed New Orleans in certain ways. One thing that I was um, very aware of and learned to be more appreciative of is the way that people misremember things. And that misremembering things can tell you about as much as remembering things correctly can tell you. Um, we had a couple of ladies in New Orleans in the Lower Ninth Ward who swear up and down that there were children trapped, black children trapped in an elementary school and no one came to get them and they all died. This never happened. They will tell you stories of these tragic events that happened in the Lower Ninth Ward and nobody cared. That never happened. But it speaks to a history of things going badly and things going wrong in their community and nobody caring. Mm -hmm. And if you follow that thread, you can come to something really serious and really pertinent that can tell you a lot about what's going on in their sensibilities in that area. And I was able to hear of misrememberings. I could hear them better after I'd heard them in New Orleans when I conducted research in the Bahamas. I heard misrememberings of what the government did and how they did this. And that never happened. There were no British troops. No, no British troops were there. There were some Canadian Highlanders, but no one, no British troops, you know, no one singing God Save the Queen. But they remembered this because they were so intent on having the presence of the monarch there during this time to give credence to the, to the riot that they took place in. So it, it helps me understand what people were feeling, what they were thinking, what they were wanting to happen, what they were wanting to explain deep in the consciousness of their soul. But they had to create a memory that didn't exist to tell me that. So that's something that New Orleans helped me understand when I interviewed in the Bahamas. I, I know um, in the rebuilding, every year for five years, one of the trade schools from Philadelphia 
would go uh, to New Orleans and, and spend two weeks, you know, helping to rebuild. <laughs> How common was that? Was that in the stories of all the different volunteer organizations that, that came through there? Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And in every hotel that we stayed in, we were with a bunch of volunteers. As a matter, in, a matter of fact, in Mary Tran's story, when she talks about the sheet rockers, they were volunteers. That's probably why the sheet rock didn't <laughs> go up so well. <laughs> but yeah, volunteerism was very strong. People were coming from all over the country. and. And um, the New Orleans residents were very appreciative and they told you about it. People treated us so well. People treated us so well. You would hear it over and over mm -hmm. again. Yes, ma'am. I think what I'm hearing is that there's the power of um, trust among people in a church community or in a neighborhood community because they've known each other forever or in a working workplace community, but but that that or that I trust people in Atlanta, so I want to get on the Atlanta bus, or I trust these people who will come and help me, or I you know we rely on each other. How so? If you rule the world, when would the historians come, and when would the economists come, and when how do you get that information so quickly? that you can translate it into who gets on these, the buses, how the Superdome is organized the next time, I see. How, I see. how do you start to rebuild. And there's all of the parts and pieces that have to happen so that, you, so that people can communicate and know that instead of everybody individually is waiting for others to come back and make that decision, so that the communication is better, so that there's a community even when the community is dispersed. So, uh, first of all, it's really important for the economist or the historian, I think really the lesson is more for the economist because we're more <laughs> likely to be guilty. The, the lesson should be, you don't know anything, right? As the, the, the quote unquote expert, whoever it is, really knows very little and that's the first thing that the expert needs to say to themselves. I know very little, okay? All of the knowledge that's useful and helpful is dispersed in these communities, in these small pockets, in the, in the church networks, in the business networks, in the, in the you know, and also, let's not forget businesses. You know, businesses are little hubs of social networking too. So it's not about the expert coming in and telling people you go here and you go there. Instead, what it is more about is let's set up some very basic, simple um, patterns, say, or guidelines, say, so that people know that they can trust that X is going to happen, like a very simple thing. So that allows me to start tapping my capacity to, to rebound. So for example, you know, what, what do we want uh, government to do in, in this, in this uh, uh, moment after a disaster? One response is, there's been so much that's been wrong with New Orleans for so long, let's have government fix it. Everything, everything that's ever been wrong with New Orleans, it, now we've got this opportunity to fix it. But in order to fix it right, you guys have to stop and not come back. We're going to fix it all and then we're going to very carefully orchestrate you back and this recovery. That was the source of tremendous delay and tremendous confusion and kept people waiting on the sidelines. And it became a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy when communities didn't come back because they were all waiting yeah. you know, for something to happen. So instead, if you, if you said, your house that you owned before, you still own it and no one's going to take it from you. Well, that would have been a really clear, if there was that clear message, then I know for sure that if I go to the effort of rebuilding it, it's still going to be mine, right? That sounds like a dead dumb simple thing, but that simple clarity around a simple rule of the game like that was really important and, it, and, it, and not having that clarity was really important and a source of a lot of, a lot of de delay. And so it's similar to the put the name on the side of the bus of where it's going. It's, it's that kind of thing. So I don't think experts come in with a great deal of expertise about the detail. And if, and if they claim that they do, don't listen to them. Right? You know, it, it's more the expert who says, I don't know very much. You all know a lot. Let's figure out ways to tap that capacity. That's, that's the quote unquote expert that, that I think makes more 
sense. I mean, I know, I know the father of the end of my neighbor. You know, yes. so I know the most trustworthy, the most capable, yeah. the the one who knows how to organize us, and who you know, and so on and so forth. And everybody already knows that, mm -hmm. and the people coming in from outside don't know that. They don't at know all. that, and that's right. So it is was, it, you know, will we all live long enough that? that <laughs> One of the things we asked all of our interviewees is, what would you do differently if you were in, in control <laughs> or something like that? And they were always so happy to hear that question because they have so many things to say and nobody's asking them. No one is asking them. And one of the changes in attitudes that I saw in my visits there, the first time I went down, it was like, why isn't government helping us? The second time I went down is, I'm not clear on what government is doing. Why aren't they clearer on how they're helping us? And the third time I went down is like, why doesn't the government just get out of our way? We have things to do, they keep putting up roadblocks. And it was, it was very a clear progression of their attitudes and feelings. And so going back to the um, point about the, the classic um, collective action problem, you know, how do you come back uh, when you don't know if others are coming back? One of the things that government can do that's really, really productive are, th are, are things like get the lights back on, get the major debris moved out of the way so that people can move uh, a vehicle down the road to gain access to their property. Those are the things that are not sexy. Um, it's not a new urbanism design. It's not a new theater district. It's not all the bells and whistles that maybe we would love to see in a perfect world. But these are the things that tap the capacity of people who can come back early. And those people who come back early are that little spark of life that send the signal to people waiting on the sidelines, oh, I can't quite come back now, but I know at least that there's activity going on there. So I'm going to orchestrate my plan to eventually. Okay, can we take two? Because we have two hands. Nicole and then you. Okay, my more of a disciplinary question. You speak of how like, economists need to learn to um, become more humanities based. Is there not then an impetus for universities to start putting in place certain kinds of programs within people who are doing economics degrees? Like I know in business you get taught ethics, but perhaps some <laughs> form of a course for economists I mean, as a historian, we learn to constantly use interdisciplinary. So, like, um, I'm learning to marry up political science to help me write my thesis. But sh surely, then, it should work both ways. And is there not a way that, at the university level, it could be implemented now, so that those of us who are graduating become who are new future leaders, or start to implement policies that need to be implemented to make the changes that society needs to have in order for us to become better? Well, it's such a segue into the platitude of, of, well, this is why we're all li you know, living and learning and teaching in a liberal arts institution, right? Is, is that we, we believe exactly what you just said, that we need the, the other disciplines to inform our perspectives. And I honestly do think that a lot of the work that's done at liberal arts colleges in terms of the economics that's done at liberal arts colleges is often far superior than what is often done at sort of research one university. So I agree with you. Um, you know, uh, doing the work, though, is the way to do it, right? That's, that's what I think, is that doing the work and showing your colleagues in, in the discipline and beyond the discipline of, what, uh, of how powerful it is. So that's been my approach. If you've got a more um, radical, um, institution-wide, um, academy-wide uh, uh, set of ideas, I would love to hear them. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll work for you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm thinking about the relationship between disaster and uh, some community cultural breakdowns. Just, you know, doesn't really need a major disaster, but they are falling apart. Um, and the, the power of the Vietnamese community because of the people connection um, versus the place connection. Um, and whether the collection of stories can actually build social structure, build back social structure that's sort of been fallen apart because of 
uh, you know, whatever, people not allowing people to come back to the homes or wanting to develop areas or whatever. You know, so I'm just wondering if, because it seems like that's kind of your field. The power of story? Building, yeah, building, building social community. structure. And, you know, so if you don't, can't have your own home in your place, so you have to move, like the Maldives, maybe all those people have yeah. to move. Yeah. You know, how do they take their culture and stories and can that be as powerful as them, their lives are? Yes, the power <laughs> stories are powerful, and they should should be employed and can be employed to build community, to build identity. And it's been, it's being done. Um, I have a friend in Montreal who is reworking the way they think about one of their French heroes, to um, to build community in, in an area in Montreal. Um, it's being done in the story of John Canoe in the Bahamas, um, and so there are ways that you can build community and build identity through telling stories, through getting people to buy in to whether it's stories of the ancestors or folklores or stories of their of their past or stories of what they can be. Yeah, it, it can be done. I don't know if it can be done in some sort of systematic way that we can introduce to every community and every culture because they're all different, but I am a firm believer in the power of stories.